Hi, everyone. This is Hal Luftig with my Broadway Podcast Network show, Broadway Biz, where every episode I will chat with my friends, some of the top theater professionals in the business, about the business of Broadway. My guest today is Jeffrey Finn, the Vice President of Theater Producing and Programming at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. Jeffrey is also a Broadway producer working on shows such as Company and Ain't Too Proud. I have always loved the Kennedy Center since I was a little kid. It's so exciting for me to get a peek behind the curtain with Jeffrey on this episode of Broadway Biz. So let's give a big Broadway Biz welcome to my good friend, Jeffrey Finn. Hey, Jeffrey, how are you? Hey there. I'm so happy to be here talking with you today. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled uh, that you're here too. And I'll, I'll tell you a little, a little secret why. To me, the Kennedy Center is like the, the Cadillac, the pinnacle, if you will, of the of performing arts centers. And I remember very clearly when I was a kid, you know, in my maybe just becoming a teenager, uh, the family went down to Washington, D.C., and we did all the obligatory, you know, monuments and, and, you know, museums and things like that. And then we went to the Kennedy Center. And I remember walking in the entrance and looking down the hall and seeing that great bust of John F. Kennedy. And then, you know, all the flags of all the different nations and the thrill of that. And, the, you know, the little secret is to this very day, when I walk into that building, I still get though that feeling as if you know I were walking in there for my first time. It, I love it, absolutely. It's such a special place. I share that exact same kind of feeling when I walk in the building. It makes me feel like a more important producer. There's something so important about the Kennedy Center, and so many people tell me, I hear again and again what a special place it really is, and how many people have special memories of it. And for me, it's been such a great experience because it's really a full circle opportunity to be overseeing theater here now because I actually started out my career at the Kennedy Center. When I was 22 years old, I was or 23 years old, I was hired to deliver some shows for them. And I was I was a new producer to New York City and it was, you know, an opportunity that I got to be a producer working at the Kennedy Center. And uh, I created a series called Broadway Songbooks of shows that were uh, composer songbooks of, you know, the classics of Cole Porter, Irving Berlin, Rodgers and Hart, Rodgers and Hammerstein with Broadway performers. And we did this for several weeks. And every time I walked into that building, I just had that exact same emotion that you were talking about. It, you, you feel like you're in a special, you know, kind of temple of theater. And it was just a, it's just a great place. And I still feel that each day as I go in there now. That is great. That is great. Color me jealous. Jeffrey, can you, can you tell us a little bit about how the journey, you know, you said you started there at, at 22, but then you at some point left because you were producing on Broadway in New York. Can you tell us how you, what the journey was back to the Kennedy say where you are now? Absolutely. I am. Um, and I, I was actually never living in DC. I grew up, I, I grew up in Boston. I went to col college in Connecticut and then I was living in New York. So I moved right from college and I went to New York City and I started producing shows there. I, I, I you know, wanted to figure out how do I become a producer because it, at that time, and I still believe that ignorance is bliss. When you're a young kid, you think you can do anything. <laughs> And that doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, illuminate the path forward in terms of how hard it's going to be later on, especially in our industry. But I started producing shows first in New York City at Rainbow and Stars, which was the cabaret room next to the Rainbow Room. 
Rockefeller Center there. And again, it was those kind of composer songbook, small cabaret shows. But I had to be paid for like doing what I did because I was not somebody that had a trust fund or, you know, family money or anything of that nature. So I was a real working producer and kind of had to get in the mud. And at that time, I also had to be a producer and a general manager and a press agent and kind of like be it as I load in the set, you know, for whatever that was and um, all small stuff. But it grew and grew. And what happened as I was able to do more of these shows, I maintained the relationship with the Kennedy Center in my you know 20s and 30s. And I was engaged to deliver about one show per season for their audiences and subscribers. And at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of touring product as much as there is now. So to that end, I was so fortunate to do one play per season for them and, and have that relationship being on the outside as a producer who they would be presenting what I did. So it's, it's um, as I said, it's very full circle now to be on the inside there. But I was in New York for all those years until I finally did come down here full time. And that was four years ago now, 2016, 2017. So that's when I moved down to DC to really be here full time. But, but before that, I was exclusively working on Broadway. Yeah, you said something interesting. I just want to backtrack for a second. You said that at some point the Kennedy Center started, you know, producing plays. Was it self-produced or was it just like a tour of something that you uh, organized to, to play the Kennedy Center? They would, they would often say, we're looking to have a play in our season and we have an open slot in March. Can you, you know, deliver a play to us? So it was truly the producer presenter relationship as we formally now know it in terms of a producer who would tour stuff around, but, or produce something on Broadway first. What I would do was I would only be producing for them. So to that end, it was to make the economics work, it was really always a challenge, obviously, because I didn't have the length of a tour to amortize all the costs. There's so many questions here now that I wanted to you know, talk about because you're, you're touching on so many topics that was actually the genesis uh, for the Broadway Biz podcast and specifically about the different aspects of Broadway and how those different aspects, the producer, director, you know, set designer, marries their artistic uh, vision with the financial. Thank you. You've opened up like... <laughs> You know, the Pandora's box of questions. So so I, I just want to uh, backtrack a second and, and talk about that and have you explain a little bit more to our listeners um, when the difference between producing something just for the Kennedy Center and how those economics would work and bringing something into the Kennedy Center as, um, as a tourist bar or as we don't call them anymore, roadhouses. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's interesting because I, it's always a challenge with the finances of theater. Theater is just expensive to produce to begin with. And I think that some of our smartest general managers and general managers in the business, who are those people who really help us run our budgets and run the numbers and figure out, you know, the profit margin or the loss or whatever it's going to be and how we spend the money that we need to spend, I'm, I personally don't know how to not think like a general manager when I produce. I feel very connected in those worlds um, because having an eye on the economics of it is, I think, as important as being able to make sure that you have an eye on the artistic success of it. And I, when I look back at some of the shows that I've produced, my greatest successes, in my opinion, have been the worlds where you've got a perfect harmony balance of an artistic success and a commercial success. Because we can always be proud of the artistic successes that are not commercially viable, that un unfortunately lose a lot of money for investors and other people. But that to me doesn't necessarily deliver, you know, what we're striving for in a commercial business. In terms of Broadway as a commercial business, we're out to sell tickets to be able to make money and deliver great entertainment. It's, it's fascinating now because living in that world and then now, now also being at a not-for-profit, I've been lucky enough to do some shows at the Kennedy Center that I've been asked to produce that aren't about making money. And so I still, it's funny, I'm like, I, I, you know, I'll be looking at the budgets and the numbers and I'll see, you know, a, a huge loss. And I'm like, 
how am I going to produce this and not lose this much money? Because I can't think in those terms of <laughs> doing something strictly for art, <laughs> which <laughs> often not for profit world is able to do. Um, and then we generate, you know, income in different ways from, you know, commercial tours or other ways that we bring in money with donors, etc. But it's a really interesting world to live between two different kind of a commercial world of Broadway and the not-for-profit world where an artistic success can be, you know, 100% artistically successful. What you just explained as a producer myself is, is almost like counterintuitive to everything we've learned, like being able to produce something. The goal is to produce something that doesn't necessarily have to make money or even break even. I don't know <laughs> that I could actually wrap my head around that. So at some point, Kennedy Center stopped being just, as I said, we don't call it anymore, a roadhouse, for lack of a better word, and started producing what I'm going to term as in-house projects. And, you know, some of them have been, in the past few years, have been fantastic. Like when they did the Sondheim retrospective in 2002, or MAME with Christine Baranski, um, you know, they're amazing productions. When did the Kennedy Center start doing that? That was definitely well before my time. I mean, I remember, like I'm sure you do, all of New York racing down for the Sondheim Festival for that entire summer. And like we were all on the Acela or the Amtrak then, you know, and all of us racing to see all the shows and, you know, bumping into each other in the hallways there. It was so special and such a magical moment. And um, I wish I had been involved with that, obviously. it was I was just a fan. But yeah, there have been shows that that have been in the past, you know, hugely produced there um, with the goal of moving to Broadway or sometimes just for the center. There have also been commercial producers who have started shows there that have wanted to bring them to Broadway. So, and that's part of what I want to continue to build in the future with opportunities because I, I do believe that starting a show at the Kennedy Center is, is a prestigious opportunity for somebody and for the show. And so to that end, it's, it's always exciting to explore that and, and, and see how we can make that happen. Part of what I wanted to do as, as I started there was to launch much more of an active producing division in addition to presenting. I love the presenting because I get to work with all my friends and colleagues in ways that I never could when I was just sitting in my own office in New York City working on my own projects. So now I get to interface with everyone on their shows. And it's really interesting in terms of, you know, how different, every show is so unique in its own world. Being able to curate the season is about being able to figure out how I can, you know, bring in the very best shows. We don't do non-equity. We only do the equity shows and tours. And we figure out what's available. And, and luckily, and certainly I can't take credit for this because it is about, you know, the building itself, the institution, but people want their shows to play the Kennedy Center. It's one of the anchor markets. So it's lucky in terms of being able to have the producers and booking agents call up and say, we want to launch our tour at the Kennedy Center, which is always a welcome thing. I totally agree. In fact, I'm proud to say that every one of my uh, shows that have toured has played the Kennedy Center. I'm very proud to say that. And I, um, I always make sure that when the show is in D.C. that I make my way down there. And, and we have posters in the green room of the Eisenhower Theater of every show that's played the Eisenhower. It's just, uh, I'm looking at those walls with the history of the stars and the productions that have been through that theater alone is just incredible. Can you tell about the, the three different spaces? Because when I ask you the next question, um, it might help if you can talk about, you know, the different spaces you make available. Most people, when they come to the Kennedy Center, know of the three main theaters. We have the Eisenhower Theater, which is 1,100 seats. We have the Opera House, which is 2,300 seats, just over. And we have the Concert Hall, which is just slightly larger. And the Concert Hall is mostly where the NSO, the National Symphony Orchestra, plays, and more of the classical or the, you know, some comedians will play in there. There'll be some one-offs for hip-hop. But the majority of the theaters that I work in would be the Opera House for the bigger musicals and the Eisenhower. What's interesting, though, is that the Kennedy Center, actually, the building itself has nine theaters in it. So there are different theaters that I'm sure, you know, most people haven't even been into or heard of before. 
We've got a beautiful theater upstairs in the terrace level called the Terrace Theater that was renovated last year. That's about 500 seats. There's a, a space called the Family Theater, which used to be the American Film Institute originally. It was, a, it was a kind of a movie theater, and that's just under 300 seats. So there's there are actually many different spaces where we can create the right show in the right venue, which is really a unique thing because I can really program up to nine different spaces in the building. And then last September in 2019, we opened an expansion campus called The Reach. And there are nine new spaces there as well. They're mostly raw spaces in terms of rehearsal rooms and, you know, kind of an open pavilion area and a lot of outdoor area space uh, that's been developed there. But officially, if you were to count it, there are actually 18 different spaces <laughs> at the Kennedy Center where we could do an event with an audience. You'll be sorry you uh, said that because next time I'm in D.C., I'm going to ask you to you take me around and show me all. I'm going to give you the, the four-hour tour, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I feel like a kid again. I'm in heaven. One of the most fun facts about the Kennedy Center in the Grand Foyer, as you were talking about where the three main theaters are, this is a true fact. You could lay down the Washington Monument. <gasps> It is that long. Wow. That is the, I'm like a little kid. That is a cool fact. There you go. Yeah. Oh my God. Next time I'm there, I'm so glad you told me. I'm going to actually like do that and imagine that I'm laying down the Washington. My, that is fantastic. So Jeffrey, with so many spaces, uh, as you described, how do you go about curating a season at the Kennedy Center? What are some of the things you you look at uh, fiscally and artistically, and how do you go about doing that with all these different you know kind of spaces and sizes that you have? I always look at a season in two different ways and dissect it differently because one, there's the presented shows and those are the Broadway tours or relationships. If I have a, if I have a, a commission with another theater a not for profit or something like that in terms of how we put that part of the season together and balance that out. And then I also look to the other side of what I want to produce and what I want to create. So in terms of curating it, it's about the balance overall and then the programming. And, you know, I would never, for example, want to deliver to our audiences a season of only revivals. You know, obviously everybody wants to see, you know, the blockbuster shows and bringing in one or two blockbusters a season is really important because everybody looks for that. But making sure that, you know, the best musical from last season or from this season or a return of a show that sold out and everybody just loved and got great reviews and bring that back for a second opportunity. That type of way is how I go about putting together the presenting of it all. And luckily, theater is the financial driver at the Kennedy Center. So I get a lot of the stage time because as you can imagine, being the nation's cultural arts center, which is what the Kennedy Center is, there are many, many other genres that you know use the stages for dance, for opera, for ballet, as I mentioned, the National Symphony Orchestra, the Washington National Opera, jazz, a hip hop department that we have. So it's, it's a building that's presenting about 2,000 shows a year, which is just a lot, as you can imagine. Yeah, I'll say. Does the Kennedy Center strive to have a certain identity? And if it does, how would you describe what the identity of the Kennedy Center is? I mean, as I, as I mentioned, is you know, being, being the nation's cultural arts center, I think that we have a responsibility. I think we have a responsibility to deliver a level of quality for the audiences that really can't be compromised. And that's also, I've always subscribed to that philosophy and the work that I've wanted to deliver for audiences, because whether it's a comedy, whether it's a drama, whether it's, you know, any other type of play, I just want it to be the best you know, production on stage that we could possibly deliver. And that I think is really what the Kennedy Center represents and stands for, which you know, that's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be a part of it. To that end, I, that's really been quite easy to be able to kind of fall in line with that and, you know, be able to, even with the things I produce there, you know, bring only the best artists, only the best, you know, talent. And that's always where we want to start. So when I arrived there, I created a new series called Broadway Center Stage, which was 
initially to do shows that would be done kind of in concert is what we imagined. In the first season, either we do three musicals a season under the banner of Broadway Center Stage, which you know we produce, which I produce there. In the first season, we did chess and in the heights and how to succeed in business. It was, you know, it's it's so fun for me because we only do these shows for eight performances. These are shows that you could never do on Broadway for just eight performances. And I get to handpick the director and the design team and the stars and really kind of like it's it's in a way been hugely rewarding. It's been artistically and commercially successful in terms of being able to deliver great audiences and, and shows and all that. But I also have to admit it's completely selfish on my part because I get to pick the shows that I want to go see myself. And that's, it's a a joke, but that's actually how I've always measured a show in terms of how I want to produce something. Would I want to buy a ticket to go to that show? And that's always been my barometer. You know, I have to say me too. When people ask me, you know, how is it, why is it that I chose to produce a certain show? I, I always say the first question I ask myself is, would I want to see this show? Would I buy a ticket to see what the this show is going to be? And if the answer, you know, is yes, you move on to the next tier of, of questions. The answer is no, you, you probably shouldn't be producing that, right? A famous producer in the business said to me on the commercial side of it all, if you've got the right product and you're raising money from your investors, that money will come in. And if you've got the wrong product and it's so hard to raise that money, you might not want to look at that show in terms of saying this is this is going to be an uphill battle. Very, whoever said that, very wise and very true. It, it's it's um, one of the road signs I think that we as producers don't always want to see, but they're there. You know, I've I've been asked you know many times like, how did that show come to be? Because it's like so bad and or it you know of course it's not successful it can't be it's so big or whatever the instance and i always say the answer is because the whoever is producing it didn't want to see the road signs and you're so right one of those you know road signs on early road signs you do a backers audition and nobody is interested that's a sign you know, I'm <laughs> it's not good when the phone's not ringing the next day. <laughs> exactly. But I wanted, if we could just go back to the eight performances thing. So you have obviously a certain budget because you're only going to run for eight performances. But now you have a director who wants something else or needs something else, as they all do. And you have to decide somehow how this would work. How does that work at the Kennedy Center? So luckily, unlike Broadway, where I we're just like you, I'll have a director saying, I need this to be a four level set with three elevators. And, you know, then you're seeing the numbers just go up, up, up. Uh, unlike that, when I started Broadway Center Stage, I went to each of the unions. I negotiated an independent contract just for these shows, and they are produced on a shoestring budget, very specific. I'm very upfront with everybody uh, with regards to the directors of what their budget is for the set, what their budget is for costumes, what I'm able to be able to spend. Because, you know, if, if I was to do these shows and continually lose so much money, that obviously would not be something that would be smart to do. I want to make sure that we can at least have an opportunity to break even. The parameters for Broadway Center Stage shows are very, very specific. But the on the flip side, the best part of it for me is to be able to go to a top A-level Broadway director and say, what's your favorite show that you've never gotten to do? And so, you know, it, it then all of a sudden there's some heat and excitement and passion around it, which is kind of why I think we do what we do anyway. That's why we're all here in the theater business, because it's so hard to make it all happen. Many years ago, I was doing, I think 2017, I was doing a Leonard Bernstein celebration and Norm Lewis was one of the stars who was in the show. And I was telling him about the Broadway Center stage shows. And I said, listen, if you ever have a dream role, that you want to do that you don't think you'll be able to, you know, do on Broadway, let me know and let's do it. And he, within three seconds, he said, I really want to play Harold Hill in The Music Man. It's a dream. And I said, great, Monday morning, I'm going to call, I'm going to get the rights and we're going to do it next season. And that happened. And Norm Lewis and Jesse Mueller signed on board and we made this, you know, incredible show happened with this incredibly talented cast and Mark Bruni directed it. And it just was, uh, you know, it's, it's just fun for everybody. I want to make sure that we're all having the best time 
and doing what we're doing. Because as I said, there's so much work. You only on those shows we only have a two week rehearsal process as well. That I could see that how that would be tough. <laughs> yeah, it's two weeks rehearsal. It's three days tech, and it's you shot out of a cannon. I mean, we we really do have it down to a science at this point. But it really was about making sure that any creative person or director, you know, knew what their resources were going into it. I mean, I also should say at the Kennedy Center, I'm super lucky and grateful that we have an incredible inventory of building, of being able to build our sets in house and being able to have so many different uh, great options in lighting and sound and all that type of stuff and video projection, et cetera. Jeffrey, when you are putting together a season for the Kennedy Center and all the different facets you just you spoke about earlier, um, do you communicate with your audience and sort of get a sense of what they want to see? Yes, yes. So in many different ways, actually. So what will happen is that for any show that I, pro- for any show that I produce, I'm actually in the theater each night. And I love talking with patrons and I now know so many of the regular subscribers who are there. And so hearing, I mean, everybody loves to tell me what they want their next Broadway center stage production to be. I've got a list, you know, that goes on for days because people are always recommending what their favorite show is. But I love talking with the audience. I love hearing, you know, especially I'm not, I'm not looking for praise. I don't want to hear good things. I want to hear the stuff that people could say like, I didn't like this. I did like that. That show wasn't for me. That show was for me. And so whether it's producing or presenting, no show is meant to please everybody. I mean, all shows are appealing to a specific group or you've got shows that are just so popular that, you know, everybody wants to get in and see it and it's a sold out event and then you bring the show back. I love talking to subscribers, you know, being an institution with a huge development department. I also talk to our donors all of the time and I'm working with the theater donors and people who who are always supporting us. And then in addition to that, we have a huge marketing team that's always doing surveys and, you know, asking, you know, in terms of what people want to see and what product and what they're most looking forward to and all of that kind of stuff so that we really feel as though we can keep our finger on the pulse of of it all. But again, I go back to saying I'm very lucky and grateful that with two huge theaters right there with the Opera House and the Eisenhower, I can often have a season where I'm producing well over 52 weeks of theater. So to that end, you know, with the Broadway shows and the Broadway tours all coming through the Kennedy Center sooner or later, it's, it's, you know, a great kind of pathway with regards to being able to continually have hopefully a pipeline from Broadway of being able to bring those shows in. Could you just briefly give me an example or two of the differences of producing for Broadway and for the Kennedy Center? I probably approach both of them very much the same. I think that at the end of the day, it would go back to Broadway is that commercial world where if I'm going to do a star play on Broadway, for example, I need to make sure that that star will sign a contract and want to do that play for, you know, what, 16, 18, 20 weeks to be able to show to my investors that this can be a successful financial venture for them. And we're going to launch something hopefully that will be, you know, done in many theaters, you know, around the country afterwards. So, it's just a different type of a scale because then, you know, it's, it's just, everything is a little bit more, everything is more expensive on Broadway because you're talking about advertising costs and, you know, all the other things, you know, there's your theater rent and all of that. Those aren't things that I need to worry about producing at the Kennedy Center. Our advertising could often be one e-blast that goes out to all of our subscribers and our theater patrons, and we can often sell out a show with one e-blast. I mean, that's unheard of, you know, in terms of like when I'm talking about the Broadway Center stage shows or something like that, where we only have eight performances. I mean, on Broadway, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising, you know, either weekly or, you know, much more so for capitalizing a show. It's true. It's fascinating. We sometimes on Broadway spend up to a million dollars in pre-opening advertising. And you guys, because of who and what you are, could sell out something in an email blast, which... It's free, actually. We just hit the button and it goes out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a machine. I never thought of the, the Kennedy Center as a, as a uh, sort of producing 
uh, machine, if you will. I don't mean that. Yeah, I mean that in the, in the most complimentary of terms. No, exa- no, but it's, it, it, it can be a machine. I mean, it's a, it's a massive institution with hundreds and hundreds of employees and obviously a press department, a marketing department, development department, education department. And, you know, as I said, my goal in the theater world of it all is to really continue to expand and grow our producing efforts. The presenting will always be there. We'll always be bringing in the best shows from Broadway. And, you know, people love seeing that. And I think one of the uh, most special things going back to the very first thing you mentioned is that people enjoy being in the building. So luckily, you know, we've got people who are locals who are regular patrons. And then, as you were saying, when you were younger and came to the Kennedy Center, we have a lot of visitors. So it's a very active place. And it's a place where people enjoy coming to see a show. It's funny because I have actually noticed a huge difference in Going to a Broadway show, I don't think people dress up like they used to, but if you were to come to the Kennedy Center to see a show, I feel like people dress up still. And it's a very interesting difference in some ways because they still feel like it's a unique experience to go to the Kennedy Center. Huh. I never thought about it, but it's true. Every time I have been there, you're right. I never see anybody in shorts or, you know, anybody sitting in the audience eating, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> I mean, it's gotten ridiculous on Broadway, but some people, how relaxed they are, which is good, I guess, right? Because you don't want people, you know, being uncomfortable. Exactly. You want you want them to enjoy the experience, but I do feel people feel responsible to dress up when they come to the Kennedy Center. They do. And I'm, I'm one of those people, guilty as charged, because I, I notice I do. I take it very you know seriously and I feel like I'm going somewhere special. Because we are recording this during the pandemic, I wanted to ask you a few things about how that has impacted this, the pandemic, the, the operations at the Kennedy Center. What has changed in your operations? And can you give an instance or two where you've had to adapt? Yeah. I mean, the, the world has changed in terms of, you know, we, we are, we're on hold. Everybody's on hold. And, and it's just a horrific moment for all of us when we can't be going to the theater and seeing shows. I mean, technically the Kennedy Center for, for our regular presentations is shut down. We have gotten um, permission to be doing some special shows. Over the summer, I produced a few concerts that were outdoors where we could have about 50 people seated socially distant, and then other people would sit further away on the grass and listen to an outdoor concert with Broadway singers. I actually have a Broadway performer coming down to do a solo concert in a couple of weeks in the Opera House. So what we've done is we've created a series called On Stage at the Opera House, and we built a stage on top of the chairs in the orchestra level where the performer will be, whether it's a Broadway performer or, or the National Symphony Orchestra quintet or something like that, or jazz group and then the audience themselves sits on the stage looking into the opera house watching the performer show so it's really a unique experience and we launched it with a show that was with renee fleming and vanessa williams and it was really a special moment just you know we've all been denied hearing live theater for so long and i miss sitting in a theater i miss watching a broadway show that i would go to you know once or twice a week or anywhere, you know, in here in DC and, you know, hearing live performance for those of us who love theater, there's just something so connecting and wonderful about that. So to be doing these shows, even for small audiences has been really, really fun and rewarding during this time. Wow. I'm glad you're able to provide not only that experience for you, because I'm, I'm with you. I so miss that experience of uh, being in a live theater, but you, for your audience too, because uh, one of the things I'm concerned about, and I'm going to ask you, is when we do come back, what sort of things do you think you'll need to do with the Kennedy Center to to get your subscribers back, your donors back? You know, the you know, making people feel like you know it's okay to come into the center. No, it's a great question. It's 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 a complicated question because I don't know if any of us know how safe we feel doing different things and everybody's got different thresholds of their own comfort level and so as we were talking about earlier we've done a lot of marketing surveys about 
how comfortable are you to return to the theater? And what would you be comfortable sitting watching a show wearing a mask for two and a half hours? And questions like that. And as you know, we're not going to be able to return Broadway with socially distanced audiences necessarily. So, you know, how long that's going to be is a questionable moment right now. But we at the Kennedy Center are working with the Cleveland Clinic as our scientific and medical advisors. And so we go by their protocols and guidelines, and it's really strict. Um, So, you know, I would normally, when I have a a performer or a show happen, provide, you know, catering and we'd have, we'd be hanging out in the green room together and we'd be chatting and laughing and talking. And these are things we just can't at the moment do in the way that we have done them before. You know, for, for my casts when I'm producing shows, I love to do, you know, an opening night party. I love to do a bagel brunch on Sundays. You know, that's, that's the way people connect and feel like they're being treated really well. And that's part of the fun of being in a show. But I think there's going to be a period of time where we're not going to be able to be providing that just for health purposes and for everybody's safety. So we'll, we'll follow, as, as everybody's saying, we'll follow the science and we'll do what we're told to make sure that everybody stays as healthy as possible. Yeah, I think that's terrific that you guys are working with um, a health official to make sure that everything is up to snuff. But I, I, I wonder, and you know, you don't want to go overboard and make a person, you know, feel like maybe I shouldn't be in this in this space. Um, yet you want them to feel safe. How do you think you guys will marry those those two objectives? I think that that's an answer that will be determined in the coming months. You know, we're going to get through the winter and figure out. You know, are we taking everybody's temperatures as they come in? Are we actually, you know, I guess providing masks? There, are, the, there'll be many different questions, you know, that that still need to be addressed because over the past several months, the most active part of my job has been throwing an entire calendar up in the air, like everybody else on the road and everybody else who's presenting shows and kind of figuring out how we're going to rebook the shows and when we can reopen. So a lot of the shows, I, you know, we were supposed to have Hamilton this past summer, unfortunately. I mean, Hamilton's still going to come back, but it's a world where, you know, we right now can't do it safely. So coming back, you know, you know, for, for everybody's safety, because we just don't have either a vaccine or the right answers yet. We want to make sure everybody who comes in the building is comfortable. We want to go to every level, you know, and measure to make sure that, you know, people feel safe and secure there. And there are some people that say that they're ready to come back now. And there are some people that say that they want to, you know, wait a little bit longer. And I think that's going to be a big question mark of how we all rebuild, not just, you know, where, where I am here in DC and all the other DC theaters, but Broadway itself. It's a, it's a huge worry because, you know, this is, you know, rubbing elbows next to somebody sitting in a seat who you don't know possibly, which is a different fear in many ways. So it's a really complicated question, which I wish none of us ever had to deal with, obviously, because none of us have had a pandemic in our lifetime. It's just a crazy new world. I totally agree, Jeffrey. It is a new world. My concern is how do we make people feel safe? Yeah, I think you're right. We just have to wait and see and just be adaptable. And I think there are going to be also so many other questions. And I think um, so much about how does Broadway come back? And, you know, our ticket price is going to be different because we were talking earlier about the economics of Broadway and how expensive it is to make Broadway shows work because, you know, we've gotten to a place, in my opinion, where the hits are, you know, bigger, the flops are bigger, and there's less that's in the middle. There's just not much in the middle on Broadway. You're either a success or you're not. And I worry about ticket prices because, we were, you know, in some fairly thin margins to be able to be getting shows to get by. And it'll be interesting to see what audience, if, if there is price resistance or not. And, you know, a host of different issues that come along with getting people back to Broadway. Jeffrey, I, I, I wonder if you have any sense. I'm sure the Kennedy Center is a uh, economic driver for D.C. When people go to the Kennedy Center, you know, they're likely to have dinner or as you were talking about the Sondheim uh, retrospective, you know, we all stayed over in a hotel, you know, parking, things like that, babysitters, all of that stuff. And 
with the closures because of the pandemic of the Kennedy Center, what are your thoughts about some of the financial impact that has had on the economy of D.C.? Yeah, I I don't know if there's any part of that that's uniquely special or specific to D.C. because I think the financial impact feels like it's everywhere. And I mean, so, you know, strictly for the Kennedy Center, it, you know, we are lucky to have some unbelievably supportive donors and many of them from the world of Broadway, who you know very well. But that said, you know, the, our, we run by being a business that sells tickets to events. And when you're talking about going for a year and a half and you talk about for us or for any theater, what that structural deficit is going to be and still having, you know, people like myself and many others working on staff and the bills need to be paid. It's a real challenge. And I, I, as I said, I don't, I don't think that's unique to the Kennedy center in any way, but I hugely worry about the theater industry with the, either not-for-profit theaters or some of the other theaters that just may not be able to afford to stay open. And again, the the job losses and the artistic loss is just saddening in so many ways because when you think about what could have been created, you know, during this time, if people had been creating more theater, that the only silver lining there is that we're going to have to come out on the other side with new talent with new people, you know, playwrights, composers, lyricists, you know, new stories to be told. And that's one of my hopes, you know, on the other side of enduring all of this now. Bravo to you, Jeffrey. I'm with you. I stand right next to you side by side. Jeffrey, uh, we're about to wind this interview up, and I just wanted to thank you again so much for taking your time and explaining, uh, you know, all the things you have today about the Kennedy Center and its operations. Thank you. This has been so much, this is so much fun talking. I love it. We can, let's keep going another two or three hours. <laughs> well, we could, you know, we could absolutely, you know, have another, you know, we could be another whole episode. So <laughs> exactly. I look forward. <laughs> me too, exactly. me too. But, but before you go, you're not done yet. I have three, what I call rapid fire questions. And all I ask is that you don't overthink. I ask a question and you tell me the first, you know, thing that comes uh, in, into your mind, okay? okay. So the first- Wish me luck, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck. So the, the, uh, the first one is, this is an easy one. What is your favorite musical? Easy. For me, it's Les Mis. It's the reason I'm a producer. It was my first job in theater. I, the, so when Les Mis opened on Broadway, they opened the first national tour in Boston at the Schubert Theater. This was 1987. And I was a senior in high school and I uh, sold (laughs) t-shirts just so I could get to watch the show every night. So um, I sold a bunch of t-shirts and I, and all of the merchandise that they had for Les Mis and I would pack up my booth really quickly, you know, turn in the receipts and run to watch the show. So I probably saw Les Mis hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Oh, I love it. I love it. I was going to say, if ever there was a reason to love a show, it's because you were selling the t-shirts. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's fantastic. Love okay. It. Here's the second one. What is the wackiest moment you've experienced in the theater? Oh, my gosh. I have two uh, things that have happened. One at the Kennedy Center, one on Broadway, that are forever imprinted on my mind that will take years of therapy to erase, probably. (laughs) Oh my God, you got to tell us what these are, yeah. So uh, the second one was a little bit worse. The first one was wacky when you ask wacky. So the first Broadway show that I ever produced was a revival of On Golden Pond that was with an all black cast. It was James Earl Jones and Leslie Uggams. And it was an amazing group of actors. And I was honored to work with them. It was in fact a show I started at the Kennedy Center and then brought to Broadway. But to get to the point of your question, there was a guy who used to come to the theater probably once a week, buy a ticket in the front row. And because it was James Earl Jones, who was the voice of Darth Vader in Star Wars, he would wear a Darth Vader mask while he watched the show. <laughs> so if that's not wacky, I don't know what is. 
<laughs> that is very wacky. Did, did James ever complain, like, you know, to you? Like, he didn't pay attention. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't that way. It's funny because he spent, he spent so much of his life being surrounded by all the, you know, rabid Star Wars fans that he was kind of used to it. But as long as we had determined that he was not a threat to the show going on, um, then, then we were fine and we let him wear his mask and sit and watch the show whenever he wanted. <laughs> so <laughs> That is great. Well, that's one wacky. What's the other wacky moment? The other wacky one happened a couple of years ago at the Kennedy Center. I guess I shouldn't name the show because they probably wouldn't appreciate being named, but there was a family-friendly blockbuster musical playing at the Kennedy Center. There was a guy there who was sitting at probably row F or G or H on the aisle in the orchestra in the opera house. Probably had gone out to dinner before the show. Probably had had a few too many drinks. And for some reason, we watched this guy get up out of his seat, walk to the front of the stage, hop up on the stage during the opening number of the musical and literally walk across the stage during the opening number. And nobody knew what was going on. But I have to applaud this cast because they were doing this huge opening number. They all kind of, you know, did exactly what they were supposed to do. He walked right across the stage. And by the time he, he was looking for a bathroom, essentially, is what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but by the time he got across the stage, off stage, they uh, had the Kennedy Center security there to take him right out of the building. <laughs> so. Gee, I wonder why. I guess you should be, <laughs> that is hilarious. That is absolutely, that's right up there with some of the wackiest things I've ever heard. I guess you should be grateful that he didn't turn to the cast in the middle of the number and say, can one of you please tell me where the restrooms are? <laughs> exactly, or, or start dancing or something. <laughs> well, you know? That's right. Oh my God, that is wacky. And just to not even realize that he was walking right across the stage in the middle of the show. Uh, <laughs> it was hilarious. It is. That is. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, that is a great, great story. Uh, okay, the last question is: um, What is something you hope to see change about the theater in your lifetime? Wow, what a great question. Change, well, I guess I'd go back to the beginning of the conversation that we were talking about for the silver lining of what happens when we come out of this pandemic on the other side of it. I hope we have a lot of new voices in the theater. I think that you know everybody who's either in our business or knows of our business knows how truly small it is. I mean, we can name on you know a couple of hands how many you know specific directors or, you know, playwrights or, you know, who are the go-tos, for example. But if we could have a much broader, more diverse group of people and really be supporting that talent, I would be elated to see that happen. And I guess the other part of that is that, you know, it's so hard, I think, to do what we do, but not for us specifically. I mean, creating a musical just creating a show to be able to have the right book that has the right tone, that has the right lyrics to the songs, that has the right feeling, you know, all of that, it's magic when it comes together. And when it doesn't, and we've all had this happen, including myself, it's, you know, you're, you look at something on stage and you're like, why doesn't this feel right? So I hope that we, you know, can get into a renaissance of sorts with regards to new voices creating new shows because that will just be you know how we can be developing so much more with great success beautifully said i stand arm in arm with you beautifully said so why don't we make that happen as you know as as producers as we come out of this let's let's make a promise to each other that we're going to make that happen. I'm on board and can't wait to see you more at the Kennedy Center. So, Jeffrey, thank you again for taking the time for us today. And I look forward to the day when I can meet you side by side under the bust of John F. Kennedy at the wonderful Kennedy Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I look forward as well. It's so much fun. Thanks, Hal. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Broadway Biz. If you have any questions about today's episode or the business of Broadway in general, let me know on Instagram at Broadway Biz Podcast or via email at broadwaybiz at halluftig.com. Be sure to follow me at Broadway Biz Podcast for updates on everything Broadway Biz, the business of Broadway. 
Broadway Biz is part of the Broadway Podcast Network. Huge thanks to Dory Berenstein, Alan Seals, and Brittany Bigelow. This has been produced by Dylan Marie Parent and Kevin Connor and edited by Derek Gunther. Our fabulous theme music is by Nell Benjamin and Lawrence O'Keefe. To learn more about Broadway Biz, visit bpn.fm slash broadwaybiz.